Welcome everyone. My name is Bridget Cabrera, she, her, hers, and I'm the Executive Director of Methodist Federation for Social Action, and we're really excited to be co-hosting this series of webinars with our coalition partner, United Methodist for Kairos Response. MFSA is a national progressive social justice nonprofit that mobilizes justice-seeking people of faith to take action on issues of peace, poverty, and people's rights within the church, the nation, and the world. We were founded way back in 1907 and wrote the United Methodist Church's first social creed in that same year. And today we continue to do the work of what I like to call shining a light on injustice and organizing justice-seeking people of faith to make change. A few announcements concerning our call today. We have a lot of people on the call. There is, uh, this is a jam-packed call. We have a lot of great information. Um, one thing to note is that we are recording the call. So um, you'll receive a recording of this call in the next few days. That will be emailed to you um, for future use and to share out with others. If you have questions, um, please feel free to type them in the chat box. There will be a section for questions during our time together, but you don't have to wait until we get there. You can feel free to type them in um, right when they come to you. But we do ask to help keep the chat um, a little clear for the questions. We ask that for the rest of the webinar, once we get started, that you only use the chat to everyone for questions to the moderators. And if you would like to chat with an individual that's on this call, to do that directly and privately. You can do that by changing um, who sees your messages by clicking on to everyone above the chat and a box will come up and you can search for the person that you're looking for. So let's just reserve the rest of this time um, for the chat for those questions. We're also offering closed captioning for this webinar. Um, you can click closed caption, that option, and click show subtitles to view. I'll be trying to take on the main points as we go along. It won't be word for word. It won't be perfect. And I apologize in advance for any errors and spelling mistakes. Um, thank you so much for being on this call. Now I will turn this over to our wonderful moderator from UMKR, Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah Webb Phillips. I'm from the North Georgia Annual Conference and I serve as a pastor in Midtown Atlanta. I am also on the National Steering Committee for the United Methodist Kairos Response. UMKR is not good. has been an international grassroots organization of United Methodists and others who are responding to the urgent call from Palestinian Christians in Kairos, Palestine, a moment of truth. Through nonviolent action and in partnership with Christians in Palestine to end the Israeli occupation and achieve a just peace in the Holy Land. Contact us if you'd like to be, want to know more or be more involved, and you'll see our information in the chat box. These co sponsored webinars of MF. SA and UMKR are held each second Wednesday of the month through November. Our next one is September 9th at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Addressing the accusation, the church and anti-Semitism is the topic and presenters will be Mark Braverman, Executive Director of Kairos USA and Bishop Hope Morgan Ward of the North Carolina Conference. Your participation today puts you on the list uh, for registration information. I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Munther Isaac is Academic Dean of Bethlehem Bible College in Palestine and Director of the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference. He is an ordained minister of the Lutheran Church and serves as Assistant Pastor of Christmas Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bethlehem. He was born and raised in Beit Saor, and although his college education studies began in civil engineering, uh, he finished out in biblical theology of the promised land at Oxford. And he is a well-known speaker in Palestinian theology and theology of the land, and active with Kairos Palestine uh, and blogger. He has published books linking Old Testament books with the theology of the land. His most recent as of this June, uh, is The Other Side of the Wall, a Palestinian Christian narrative of lament and hope. 
and we put that information in the chat as long with uh, other pertinent things that our speakers will mention. He also writes articles and is a regular contributor to Sojourners. He's married and has two boys ages five and seven and admits that he is passionate about football, American and European, and his soccer team is Liverpool and he favors the Eagles. Our next speaker is Dr. Steven Sizer. He is the founder and director of Peacemaker Trust, a registered charity dedicated to peacemaking. He was awarded a PhD from Oxford with a thesis on historical roots, basis, and political consequences of Christian Zionism. He was ordained in the Anglican Church and had searched various parishes in England where he has worked with asylum seekers and refugees in the Southampton area. He is a trustee of Living Stones of the Holy Land Trust, advancing education about Christianity in the Holy Land through pilgrimages and connections with charities there. Among other witnesses, uh, he has co-authored uh, the Jerusalem Declaration of Christian Zionism for the heads of churches in Jerusalem, along with the Bethlehem Evangelical Affirmation. He is author of three books, the most recent being Zion's Christian Soldiers, The Bibles, Israel, and the Church. His books have been translated into Arabic, Farsi, Korean, and Spanish, and he also publishes widely in other means. There's, of course, much to add about both these persons, but let me just say he's been married to Joanna long enough to have four children that have produced uh, seven grandchildren, all under the age of five and he enjoys photographing God's creation. So we welcome them and all of you with us and we will get started. Each presenter has about 17 minutes. Uh, so Dr. Isaac, let's begin with you. Yeah, I think it's the other way around. I'm happy to- oh, okay, uh, Dr. Sizer, we'll begin yeah, with you. It's me first. Right. Um, we're thinking about Christian Zionism today, and I want to begin by asking the question, what is Christian Zionism? Don Wagner in his book, Anxious for Armageddon, says Christian Zionism is a movement within Protestant Christianity that views the modern state of Israel as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, thus deserving our unconditional economic, moral, political, and theological support. Now, clearly there are Christian Zionists within the mainstream denominations, uh, Roman Catholic and, and, and other denominations, but as a movement, it is primarily uh, a, a predominant within the Protestant church and the evangelical church in particular. Jerry Falwell Jr. said recently, I think evangelicals have found their dream president reuniting Israel and with uh, America. And when he was asked, is Trump like biblical Queen Esther who saved the Jews in Persia? Mike Pompeo said, well, as a Christian, I certainly believe that's possible. Benjamin Netanyahu said uh, a few years ago, I don't believe that the Jewish state and modern Zionism would have been possible without Christian Zionism. We value our friends, we'll never forget them. We think that you have helped establish here a powerful memorial to our friendship and our common ideals. Now, why would he say that? Well, uh, it's because of the size and influence of this movement. Um, John Hagee, who founded Christians United for Israel, said this recently, the sleeping giant of Christian Zionism has awakened. There are 50 million Christians standing up and applauding Israel. Think of our future together, 50 million evangelicals joining in common cause with 5 million Jewish people in America on behalf of Israel is a match made in heaven. Well, if we deconstruct the fact that not all 5 million Jewish people in America are Zionist, uh, but we give him the benefit of the doubt on the 50 million, I think you can see that the Christian Zionist movement is at least 10 times larger than the Jewish uh, Zionist movement. That's where the power lies. And what is their political agenda? Well, their political agenda is very largely directed on Washington, uh, lobbying the White House and Congress on behalf of Israel. And these are some of the Christian organizations that on a daily basis are lobbying senators and congressmen as well as the White House on behalf of Israel. Uh, Christian Zionist organizations are active in funding the emigration of Jews to Palestine. 
uh, International Christian Embassy since 1980 has sponsored uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of, of Jewish people from around the world to make Alia and uh, find a home uh, invariably in the occupied West Bank. Uh, more recently, <coughs> they've been involved in assisting Ethiopian Jews to make that journey. You'll find Christian organizations expressly set up to support the illegal settlements. Um, Sandra uh, uh, Barras, for example, founded uh, Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, and they are active in assisting churches in the West adopt, uh, fund, uh, support, campaign for the Israeli settlements. The move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem uh, is the fourth element of their agenda, and they've achieved that. Since about 1980 onwards, uh, the International Christian Embassy has been putting pressure on the U.S. administration to move its embassy because they recognize that if the U.S. moved its embassy, everyone else would have to follow suit, and that would be the end of the two-state solution. That's been achieved, and now we're moving on to the annexation of the West Bank. There's also within their agenda uh, often a commitment to see the, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Haram al-Sharif, destroyed and the, the Jewish temple rebuilt. And Gershon Salomon is the founder of the Temple Mount Faithful. He's a, a regular speaker in many Christian churches in the States. Uh, he said this in the London Times recently. He said, we must have a war. The Messiah will not come by himself. We should bring him by fighting. These books by Randall Price and Tommy Ice are just a, a selection of those uh, that are on sale in Christian bookstores that promote the rebuilding of the uh, Jewish temple. Sadly, uh, you find within Christian Zionism uh, a lot a, a, des a dem denigration of Arabs, Islam, and in particular the peace process, because surely share, uh, trading land for peace must be a compromise on on their conviction that God gave the Jewish people uh, the entire uh, land. Uh, Franklin Graham uh, made this appalling statement in 2012 in the Charlotte Observer. He said, the Arabs will not be happy until every Jew is dead. They hate the state of Israel. They all hate the Jews. God gave the land to the Jews. The Arabs will never accept that. That's an appalling statement. Uh, and, and I deeply regret that he made it. Uh, this really brings us together to their, uh, to their view of the future, which is very pessimis pessimistic. Indeed, it's apocalyptic. And these are the kinds of books that keep many Christian bookshops open, uh, speculating about what's going to happen next. Um, when uh, Ahmadinejad was uh, 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 leader in, in, uh, in Iran, this is what uh, uh, John Hagee said. It is 1938. Iran is Germany, Ahmadinejad is the new Hitler. We must stop Iran's nuclear threat and stand boldly with Israel. He said, Iran is a clear and present danger to the United States of America and Israel, and that it's time for our country to consider a military preemptive strike against Iran if they won't yield to diplomacy. And this isn't a politician, this is a Christian leader with access to 50 million Christians in the States calling on his government to attack another country, to fulfill Bible prophecy. Well, what is the biblical basis? In, in the few minutes I've got left, I just want to give you a flavor for the foundation upon which this movement is built. And I want to show you how easy it is to deconstruct it. The question is, what is the relationship between Israel and the church and the Bible? And uh, the foundation of this movement goes back uh, to the 19th century, but particularly in the first half of the 20th century, it was a Schofield reference Bible that uh, really uh, enabled this movement to develop. And there are seven common assumptions which um, Christian Zionists make from the Bible. The first is that God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel. The Jewish people are God's chosen people. The promised land was given by God to the Jewish people as their everlasting inheritance. Jerusalem is their exclusive and undivided capital. The temple must be rebuilt. There will be an end time battle of Armageddon. And God has a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. Well, these common assumptions, I liken them to a balloon. A balloon of hot air. How many pins do you need to burst a balloon? Well, I'll give you seven. 
or at least this, uh, this, uh, in this presentation, I'll give you three. But we can take each of those assumptions and show very easily how they can be deconstructed. And um, on my website, stephensizer.com, you can access a, a short uh, uh, article which summarizes these seven answers. They're based on my book. And you can access the text for free uh, from my website if you want to elaborate or explore any of these subjects further. And there's a video where I take uh, a bit longer and at a slower pace, uh, take you through these seven assumptions. But let me just give you a flavor. Uh, where does this idea come from that God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel? Well, God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. Now, the first observation we need to make is that that promise was made to Abraham and no one else. No one else. But God made another promise to Abraham a few uh, chapters later. He said, I'll surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore, and through your seed, all nations on earth will be blessed. And that's what Zionists capture. They take that word seed and say, that's the Jewish people. But a very important principle of, of biblical interpretation is to allow scripture to interpret scripture. And this verse, this very verse, is quoted in the New Testament, in Galatians chapter 3. It's almost as if the Apostle Paul is anticipating the abuse of that promise. He says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed, Scripture doesn't say to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. So you see what we've done. We've allowed the scripture to interpret scripture, the promises re uh, referring to Jesus, not to Israel. What about the idea that uh, the people descended from Abraham, the Jewish people, are God's chosen people today? What we actually find in the New Testament is something very different. Uh, sorry, in the Old Testament as well as the New. Um, Isaiah 56 is a good example. Uh, notice that it is the Lord say, says this. Let no foreigners who bound themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Now just think about that. Why would people say the Lord will exclude me from his people when the Lord doesn't want foreigners to say it? The answer simply is, is because the Lord's people were doing the excluding. And that's why Jesus quotes this passage in the temple when he clears out the money changers from the court of the Gentiles, because they were inhibiting people of other nationalities from worshipping the one true God. This is one of my favourite verses in the Bible, Esther 8, verse 17. It's the end of the story of Esther. We've seen God deliver his people as joy and gladness, feasting and celebrating. Feast of Purim today. But notice what the verse goes on to say. Many people of other nationalities became Jews. How many nationalities? How many as many people? It means that the people of God, the Jewish people in the Old Testament, were made up of many nationalities. I hear not somebody. Sim not simply those who had been descend were descended physically from uh, Abraham. We burst that one. And one more. Well, one last more. The promised land uh, given by God to the Jewish people as everlasting inheritance. Well, the promise goes back to or the premise goes back to Genesis 15, where God says on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land. And Zionists say, God gave us the land. He gave us the land, not you. But a few uh, a few chapters later in uh, in Leviticus, notice what God says. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Now, does that contradict the promise he made in Genesis? No. It's the difference between freehold and leasehold. God wasn't giving them the freehold. He was giving them leasehold. He was saying the land is mine, but I'm allowing you to live in my land. I'm giving you the land, but you're there as foreigners and strangers. He was giving them the leasehold. And when they rebelled, he kicked them out. And when they repented, uh, the prophet's message was, if you repent, you can return. But notice the conditions God gave them in that return. When God says something once in scripture, it's true. When he says consecutive 
the same thing twice in two verses. It must be important. But why would God say the same thing in three consecutive verses? He does it here, Ezekiel 47. Distribute the land a lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the foreigners. Consider them as native-born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance. In whatever tribe of foreigner resides, you are to give them their inheritance. Why does he have to say it three times? Because they didn't want to share the inheritance. You see how easy it is to deconstruct this, uh, this uh, theology. What is the relationship between Israel and the church? Well, Zionism takes the promises of the Old Testament about the Jewish people, Israel, Jerusalem, and ignores the coming of Jesus and applies them to the Jewish people today in perpetuity. It's as if the coming of Jesus was unnecessary. And what about the church? Well, John Nelson Darby, who founded the Brethren, who was the precursor to the Schofield Reference Bible, he said the church is a parenthesis. It's an interruption to God's continuing purposes for Israel. That's the basis of Christian Zionism. The question you've got to think about is this. Was the coming of Jesus the fulfillment or the postponement of the promises God made to Abraham? When we put the whole of the Bible together, I liken it to an hourglass. And the promises God made to Abraham are fulfilled in the book of Revelation, but they only go through Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, how large was the remnant? Well, at the cross, who was there? The disciples had run away. There was Mary, uh, John, and the mother of Jesus. But were, with respect, were they singing when I survey the wondrous cross? No, they were weeping because they didn't understand what Jesus was doing. He was the seed. He was Israel. He was the remnant. And it was only after his resurrection that he restored his disciples. And the good news through Pentecost uh, enlarged the, uh, the people of God to embrace all nations as it had under the old dispensation. When we read the Gospels, we find repeatedly Jesus emphasizes that the scriptures about him. It's about himself. And unless we see Jesus as central, not Israel, we've misunderstood the Bible. Zionism is like a can of Sprite. Uh, it's, it, it likes to take the exclusive promises of the Bible and says, these are ours. It's our identity, our land, our city, our temple. But what I've tried to show you, giving you a flavor, is what happens when you take the inclusive clauses, the inclusive promises. What happens to the exclusive ones? changes color and you cannot go back the bible is a progressive revelation it's a one-way journey you cannot go back and claim exclusive rights when god has broadened those uh, promises so the promises are on the basis of grace through faith not race and works seven assumptions i hope uh, i've given you a flavor how easy it is to deconstruct this theology more seriously the heads of churches in Jerusalem uh, affirmed a declaration a number of years ago. It was uh, based on an earlier one, which uh, the Seville International Conference wrote, in which they said, quote, we categorically reject Christian Zionist doctrines as false teaching that corrupts the biblical message of love, justice, and reconciliation. We reject the alliance of Christian Zionist leaders and organizations with elements in the government of Israel and the United States presently imposing the unilateral preemptive borders and domination over Palestine. Rather than condemn the world to the doom of Armageddon, we call upon everyone to liberate themselves from ideologies of militarism and occupation and instead pursue the healing of the nations. That's our calling and that's our mandate. Check out the outline. Have a look at my books. They're freely available on my website. Check out Peacemakers where you'll find out more about what we're up to. And uh, if you want to delve deeper into this movement, check out christianzionism.org. Some really good resources there. Check out FOSNA, Friends of Seville, North America. Uh, Jonathan's going to tell us a little bit more about that uh, later. And more importantly, even now, book your place for the Christ at the Checkpoint in Bethlehem, June next year. And I'm sure Monty will tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you very much. And my apologies for messing up the PowerPoint to begin with. Sarah, you're muted.
If you have questions, if you will put those in the chance and then we'll uh, get to those uh, after Dr. Isaacs. Okay, go ahead. So good uh, afternoon or uh, good evening if you're uh, watching from uh, Palestine. Uh, I was looking at the names and I saw so many familiar names from all over the world. Uh, special shout to Alex Awad who started Christ at the Checkpoint and uh, uh, now has become a very important uh, meeting. I saw uh, you also with us, Assis Alex, uh, uh, especially. Uh, I'm going to uh, build on Stephen's uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, my talk today is based on uh, my recent book uh, that was published in June, The Other Side of the Wall. And I'm going to look at Christian Zionism as a movement and theology uh, that has dismissed us as Palestinians uh, on the other side of the wall, uh, not just in the physical sense, uh, but more so in, in a much deeper uh, sense. And as I said, I'm going to build on what Stephen has said, but speak on Christian Zionism from a Palestinian Christian perspective. Our experience as being uh, uh, people who suffered through the Nakba, uh, suffered through a continuous occupation, and how does Christian Zionism deal with that? You all know what Nakba is in our uh, uh, explanation as Palestinian, our catastrophe. Uh, a catastrophe, as I always say, with biblical proportions. Uh, we're talking about huge numbers in terms of the towns that were completely destroyed, the refugees, uh, and then the ongoing Nakba in terms of the occupation, the displacement of Palestinians, uh, the separation wall that cuts deep into our land, confiscates land, uh, the daily injustices that we go through as Palestinians, all of that, whether it's through uh, the, uh, you know, how natural resources are distributed, the checkpoints, the confiscation of land, uh, the dual systems that we find today in, in how the law deals with the Palestinian different than it deals with the Israelis. All of that was celebrated by Christians and Christian Zionists as a sign of divine miracle. Uh, as a sign of divine intervention, as an act of God. Uh, and so I, I want you to see how uh, from the one side it's our catastrophe, but from the other, it is celebrated as, as an act of God. Uh, I usually use these four statements to summarize the positions of Palestinian Christians. And I usually ask uh, uh, friends who visit Bethlehem, especially from uh, an evangelical background, as they read these statements, to consider how are the Palestinians portrayed uh, in these statements. Uh, and after I read them and you have them in front of you, whether it's about the Abrahamic covenant uh, uh, as continuing today with Israel, the creation of Israel as a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, if you bless Israel, God will bless you. Stephen mentioned that, uh, the promises of the land. How are Palestinians portrayed in these statements? And of course, that's a trick question because we're not mentioned at all. Uh, and that's, uh, to me, one of the most crucial elements to emphasize. We are invisible in the theology uh, and narrative of Christian Zionists. It is as if Israel was established on an empty land. Uh, it is as if, you know, they, they, I always call the myth of the return to an empty land, as if, uh, you know, we did not exist uh, before that. Uh, and from our perspective, we would be asking questions like, why would God do this to us? I'm talking about the Nakba, in order to fulfill a prophecy, to fulfill a prophecy. Is God against us? Uh, 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 when you speak about the covenant as continuing with uh, 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 the other side of the equation uh, 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 and so on. And you see, again, in these statements in these positions by Christian Zionists, in these actions, in the billions of dollars that they invest in Israel, not in the church, but in Israel, uh, Palestinian Christians are ignored at best. It's as if we don't exist, but even dehumanized and attacked uh, at worst. And I'm going to take you back to the uh, first infamous slogan of, of, uh, of Zionism, the idea of a land without a people for a people without a land. We all know that the big problem with this statement is that the land had people. But Christians who used this slogan and who promoted our land as a land without people knew exactly that the land had people. But to them, we were not as important. 
we were of a complete irrelevance. For the Zionist Palestine was empty, not literally, but in terms of people of equal worth. Uh, it's a typical colonial mentality, dare I say a typical colonial Christian mentality where people come to the land and it's as if it's empty because, well, they're the Arabs, we can move them. We can uh, uh, declare half of their land or more to the new Jewish uh, settlers who will serve the interest uh, of our uh, colonial ambitions and our uh, empire. Uh, and this mentality continues today in a more subtle manner uh, in the church whenever they speak about the land. This is a question I always use from a debate on a major uh, Christian American evangelical website called Christianity Today, discussing the questions, do Jews have a divine right to Israel's land? Uh, and notice, of course, that they've already called it Israel's land, so there's nothing to debate. But more importantly, we should ask the question, who is asking, who is debating uh, uh, this statement, whether Jews have a divine right to the land? Uh, of course, it's an American pastor sitting at the conference's office, and, and, and dare I say, uh, an American white pastor, uh, and a Messianic Jewish pastor at the comfort of their offices discussing our land as if it's empty. And we want to say, but what about our perspective? We only happen to be living in this land. And in fact, at the time I emailed Christianity Today, I explained I am an evangelical Christian from Bethlehem. At the time I was doing my PhD in England, in Oxford, and I felt I should be part of the conversation. But after back and forth, I wasn't even asked to comment uh, on, this, uh, on this dialogue. And again, this underscores the issue we do not exist or we are irrelevant in the minds of Western Christians who write about our land. Uh, today, if you visit our land, you will see the separation wall that seeks to block us, shield us from not just the Israelis, but even the visitors. It's as if they, they want to prevent people from seeing us. Uh, I always say, if the Church of the Nativity was not in Bethlehem, nobody would have visited uh, the Palestinian site. Uh, but there is a wall that existed long before that wall, because we have always been invisible, whether in theology book, uh, uh, theology books, the, the statements of the churches, the position, the language of the church, we did not exist. Uh, whenever they spoke about the myth of returning to an empty land, uh, we did not exist. To me, this is the original separation wall, uh, a wall that dismissed our uh, existence. And I want to tell you something about walls. Walls not simply divide, but they stereotype. They communicate that those on the other side of the wall are dangerous, are to be feared. They're not like us. And I will explain more how the ideology of Christian Zionism emphasizes these points. Uh, and ultimately, you can even justify violence against those on the other side uh, of the wall. So... The wall is built from the perspective of the powerful. And again, I'm not just talking about the physical wall. I'm talking about a much deeper reality. It's built by those who think they are entitled because God is on their side. And it's not simply as, uh, you know, God is in uh, the Jewish side, but also on, uh, on the state. So it's not just a chosen people. It's a chosen state uh, that, you know, that language is used to, pressure people, not just to stand with the Jewish people, but to stand with Israel. Uh, and to stand against Israel becomes standing against God, because this is God's state. Uh, again, it's not simply about uh, the people. This is a quote from, uh, again, Jerry uh, Falwell. And so anything you say against Israel becomes something against God. The language of divine right, for example, Christians, the same Christians who go crazy when this language is used by Muslims have no problem applying the same exact language uh, on Israel. Those on the powerful side of the wall apply the Judeo-Christian tradition language to promote cultural or to communicate cultural superiority as if they're better than the others. Uh, here is a quote from uh, people praying over Trump just before he was elected. Uh, uh, a messianic uh, Jewish leader, uh, uh, you know, Christian Zionist. Only two nations have been in relationship in history with God, Israel and the United States. Again, this is not 
just a, uh, th this statement explains, typifies how they view their position as superior to others because God is on their side. And to me, one of the most powerful statements that uh, uh, illustrates the theology and ideology of Christian Zionism uh, is this quote from Mike Pence when he spoke in the Israeli uh, Knesset. This is a very important quote. Uh, and remember, Mike Pence is a self-proclaimed, you know, not just Christian, but I think Christian Zionist. We stand with Israel, he said, because your cause is our cause. Your values are our values. And your fight is our fight. We stand with Israel because we believe in right over wrong, in good over evil, and in liberty over tyranny. Not only there is a sense of superiority in this statement, we are the right side, we have the better values, but look how the Palestinians are portrayed. We are the wrong, the evil, and the tyrant. We are the ones on the other side uh, of the wall. And lest you think that maybe he was talking about Muslims, no, no, the same attacks have been labeled on Palestinian Christians as well. Uh, we mentioned Christ at the checkpoint. Sabil has the same experience. Uh, Kairos has the same experience of being attacked and labeled by Christians simply for challenging the Israeli narrative and the Christian Zionist narratives. We've been labeled all sorts of things with the goal of shutting the conversations by uh, demonizing the messenger, calling us things, labeling us so that people don't actually engage uh, with us. All of these were statements said about Palestinian Christians. I stopped actually collecting these uh, accusations uh, after a while. Uh, it's all part of a campaign to silence Palestinian Christians. Over the years, we've been silenced. We've been disinvited from conferences, even conferences in seminaries, even mission conferences about Palestine and Israel, even mission conferences in general, where we were disqualified to lead uh, Bible studies. It's all because... I believe we break the stereotype. We challenge the common narrative that this is a clash between the Judeo-Christian civilization and Islamic terrorism by saying, yes, religious extremism is a challenge, but the occupation uh, is the core issue. And in many, many circles, this is not a popular message. Similarly, we want to control the monopoly of the Bible using the Bible, as we have here, the Israeli ambassador, and as many Christian Zionists have done in the past, using the Bible to justify the occupation, to justify oppression. Uh, I love this quote from Kairos, any use of the Bible to legitimize or support political options that are based upon injustice and imposed by one person on another, or by one people on another, transform religion into human ideology and strip the word of God of its holiness its universality and uh, truth. We want to highlight the importance of justice. There can be no theology that can be okay with the, the, the abuse of human rights, that be okay with inequality, with treating people differently. Any theology that teaches that certain people are superior to others uh, or that God privileged certain people over others must be challenged. It's a biblical concept. Justice matters to God, it should matter to us. Uh, and it breaks my heart to see that even the concept of justice challenged sometimes by Christian Zionists, as we have in this quote by another Christian Zionist called Daniel Juster, who said, justice in this land means accepting that God gave it to the Jewish people. If Palestinians fail to see that, they are themselves unjust, foundationally unjust and resisted by God. You see what's happening here to him, justice is accepting the premises of Christian Zionism. We will continue to speak despite all of these attempts to silence us. And we will continue not just to challenge Christian Zionists, but to challenge churches that are silenced, churches that are doing nothing, churches that are too polite, too diplomatic, that only care about their own spirituality. We will continue to highlight that for us, the Bible is about the love of God to all people. It's about a kingdom that breaks all barrier, a kingdom uh, that communicates that God is for, uh, uh, God is love and that God is peace and God is just. To us, we take commandments like peacemaking very, very seriously. 
And I want to conclude with these few ideas that it's not enough to challenge the theology of Christian Zionism, but we need to offer an alternative. It's not enough to complain about the lack of justice uh, in their theology, but we must present an alternative uh, based on our convictions uh, in, in promoting peacemaking. Peacemaking that is bold, not simply diplomatic or let's pray for both sides. Peacemaking that speaks truth uh, to power. We must also present uh, and, and uh, I, I, you know, something that Stephen mentioned that I want to bring it not just to the, the theological concept, but to the things on the ground, the whole idea of sharing the land. This is God's land. As such, we must share it. And this should be our response to Christian Zionism. Our response is not an exclusive message that this is the certain people's land, but this is God's land and we have to share it. Sharing is different than dividing. And I think this is really important. Dividing means this is your territory, this is mine. Ultimately, we will not get along. As churches, we must highlight these issues. All the land, all the dwellers of the land should share the resources equally. They should have the same rights, uh, same responsibility, regardless of religion or ethnicity. There should be no second-class citizens uh, in the land. As such, we should always, for example, challenge the racist uh, nation-state law that Israel passed in the last uh, uh, two years. And so our response should be one of sharing, uh, of, of equality. We must continue to build of that. Kairos reminds us of that in their uh, powerful statement, our future and their future are one. We're not talking about dividing and building our destinies separately from one another. Uh, but similarly, in another statement from Kairos, Palestine, uh, I think this statement is powerful because it organizes things in the right order. Yes, we can organize our political life with all its complexity according to the logic of God's love and the power of God's love, after ending the occupation and establishing justice. So I believe as Christians, and I'm coming to my conclusion here, we need to put our efforts to put an end to the occupation, establish justice, the principles of shared ownership, the principles of equality, all people should be treated equally. Uh, and, and then think of political solutions that bring these realities together. We should continue to dream we should challenge the church in its theology, in the way it's pray, it prays. We should provide liturgical prayers that promote these ideas of a shared land, of peace, of ending the occupation. And we should act. Uh, we should act in every manner. And just to say in conclusion, if you're looking for a way forward, what should we say? I strongly encourage you to visit another important resource that we just worked on uh, very, very recently called Cry for Hope. Uh, a document by the Global Kairos Movement in uh, coordination with Kairos Palestine uh, that offers many uh, important steps uh, mm -hmm. that lead to uh, sustainable peace. Not simply to say Christian Zionism is wrong or what's happening in the land is wrong, but offers many, many important steps, whether through pilgrimage, through processes of theological affirmations, okay. government pressures, praying we'll, and partnering. We'll put that Thank in you. Our chat as well. And uh, you both have given us so much to think about, and it's it's hard to stop someone who starts preaching. <laughs> so, uh, but we'll begin with our uh, questions, and uh, here may be a good one for us to begin with. It's been said that Christian Zionism is broadly accepted by many of the world's Christians, but is not a deeply held or central conviction. In your experience, is this true or not, and why? Uh, so a short answer from both of you, perhaps. Stephen, I haven't heard it. Yeah, sorry. Okay, go ahead, Mother. Uh, my view is that Christian Zionism is a very shallow, uh, superficial theology that relies on some of the passages I've shared with you uh, and, and others that are, are repeated over and over again with no connection to what the Bible actually says. Uh, and, um, that, you know, most people would rather die than think, uh, said Bertram Russell, most people do. I think Christians, uh, 
rely too heavily on believing what their pastors tell them uh, or about the books that they read. You know, Tim LaHaye's Left Behind books, Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth. Um, you know, those kinds of books are so popular and so influential. People read them and believe that the quotes that they contain from the Bible um, are, are, are true. Um, what we find in the Acts of the Apostles is that um, the Bereans are held up as the kinds of Christians we should be. It says that they tested uh, what Paul said to see from the scriptures whether it was true. And I think that's where Christian Zionism is, uh, it, it, it is shallow. And, uh, and that's why I love trying to deconstruct it in debate with Zionists uh, in their misuse of the Bible. Um, okay. I think we target it scripturally and the edifice collapses. Mother, do you have a response? No, just the same. And just to emphasize that in, in when addressing Christian Zionists, it is important to show from the Bible that this theology is misguided. Uh, it's not simply enough in many times to say, what about Palestinians and the abuse of their rights? But it's important to show from the Bible. And there are many, many resources, many brilliant theologians all over the world, including Palestinian Christians who have written to deconstruct the theology of Christian Zionism. Okay. Uh, another question, is it correct to say that Zionist Christianity is a doctrine that supports a colonization ideology and therefore in opposition to Christ? Christian Zionism was a colonial experiment. Uh, Christian Zionism preceded Jewish Zionism by about 50 years. Um, uh, Lord Shaftesbury was talking about a land with no people for a people with no land 50 years before Herzl uh, adapted the quote uh, for his uh, fledgling Zionist movement. And had it not been for Christian leaders uh, facilitating uh, the early Zionists' um, uh, meetings with politicians and kings and so on, uh, Zionism would have achieved probably as much as we see uh, the Kurds or the Armenians uh, achieving uh, their own self-determination. So uh, Zionism was uh, a colonial experiment, untimely born. Uh, had we not had the Second World War, uh, the British colonial experiment in Palestine would have uh, achieved a, a Zionist state probably in the 1910s, 1920s. And I've often spoken about Christian Zionism as an imperial theology today. Uh, a theology that sides with the powerful, a theology that is at home with the, with the powerful and the expansion uh, uh, mentality of many Christians, a theology that promotes fear of the other, uh, rejection and dismissal of the other, as I have just uh, explained. So certainly I look at Christian Zionism, uh, at least in its very militaristic uh, expression, as an imperial theology. Do Christian evangelicals fund curriculum in the public and private schools in Israel? And what kind of influence are they having in that way? So, You mean do uh, evangelicals influence schools in Israel? Um, well, in, do they, do they, is their curriculum in churches uh, uh, from evangelicals that would hold this. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, Zionism. I mean, it's, you don't need actually a curriculum, honestly, because it is by, by and large the default position of many Christians who hear Israel in the prayer and attribute it to the modern state of Israel. And as Stephen highlighted, uh, there is still, there has always been, and today maybe even a revival in prophecy books. Uh, uh, the lay, uh, you know, the Left Behind series sold more than 85 million copies. I mean, just think of that number alone. Uh, so it comes by default that in many, uh, most evangelical churches and many Protestant churches, that is the default position. You actually have to de to work harder to deconstruct years of, uh, of of you know layers of that theology before you convince them that there is actually a different reading to scripture. We're, we're at our time, but we're going to go, we're going to take a, a, 
a few more questions, so we'll go a little bit over time. Uh, for either one of you, is it true that Christian Zionist organizations in the U.S. are supporting settlements and the IDF with tax-exempt donations? Uh, what would a campaign look like that closed the loophole in the U.S. and elsewhere? I did address that in my presentation. Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, CFOIC, uh, along with uh, the International Christian Embassy, uh, Bridges for Peace, and other organizations like that do support the settlement program. Uh, there was a time when uh, Christian Friends of Israeli Communities was encouraging churches to adopt a settlement. Um, and when you realize that churches might have 20, 000, uh, 20, 30,000 members and a settlement might have 100 people, you can see where the power lies. Um, so yes, there's been a, a, a Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, the International Christian Embassy has, been, has bought armor-plated buses to take uh, settlement children out of the settlements into schools and so on. Um, but certainly their political campaigning on behalf of Israel is targeted towards the theft of Palestinian land uh, and, the, and the expansion of the settlements. And, and all of this, here is the irony. The irony is that in a time when BDS is being uh, criminalized in the United States as illegal, it's perfectly fine to fund and support illegal settlements. And something needs to be done about that. I mean, and, and that speaks uh, strongly to the role uh, of the United States in the ongoing occupation of, uh, of the Palestinians. And the important needs to do more grassroots works and even legal work uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. What is Muslim theology on Christian Zionism? Well, there are a range of uh, Muslim perspectives on Christian Zionism. Uh, the majority of Muslims I work with and know are um, uh, as discouraged and uh, frustrated with uh, Christian Zionist influence over U.S. foreign policy and European policies as we are. And um, I spend quite a bit of time helping them understand that Christian Zionism is an aberration or heresy rather than uh, mainstream or orthodox. Uh, but then there is the counter movement within uh, Islamism um, uh, where a mirror image of Christian Zionism has a similarly apocalyptic view of the future. And I think the, the, our role is to work and uh, reach out and work with uh, Jewish groups and Muslim groups who have a common interest in the sharing of the land, in justice, peace and reconciliation, uh, rather than point scoring or targeting each other or demonizing each other uh, with our theology. And uh, the uh, very concerning development recently is the uh, rise of what can, one can call uh, Muslim Zionism or Zionism. Not in the sense of adopting the theology, but in the sense of uh, uh, feeling, uh, uh, you know, supporting Israel. And uh, the growth of this is related, you know, to different factors. Uh, the Sunni Shia fraction in the Middle East have caused many Sunni countries now to side with Israel just to defeat the, the Shiite uh, branch. Uh, one of the most fascinating developments we've been seeing, uh, we saw recently is uh, evangelical Christian Zionist pastors, listen to me, evangelical Christian Zionist pastors visiting the Saudi crown prince, visiting the Egyptian president, Assisi, mm -hmm. talking about an important steps, changing the perception of Israel in these Arab countries. And of course, we know what's happening here. They're trying to build new alliances uh, that, you know, where uh, these Sunni countries would side with Israel in order to fight uh, Iran and uh, the way they back Hamas and so on. Uh, and we're seeing flirting between many uh, uh, Arab leaders and, and Israel. Um, two more questions uh, more related to our, our Christian perspective here. Uh, Christian liturgies, frequent references to Israel and the Israelites in prayers, readings, and hymns reinforce Christian Zionist perspective. How can we remedy uh, that? I think two ways that I do. Uh, one is every time I 
use the word uh, Jew, for example, Jewish people, I would never uh, question someone's uh, claim in terms of their their ethnicity, their identity, their faith. Someone said, I'm Muslim or I'm Jewish, and I accept that. But if we're using the terms biblically, I hope I've shown you that the word uh, Jew in Esther was a word that described people of many nationalities. It was, a, it was a word equating with one's faith, not one's race. And that's how the Apostle Paul uses it in Romans. Not all Israel are Israel. Not everyone who claims to be a Jew is a Jew. So as long as we use biblical terminology, such as Jew or Israel, in an inclusive way, then when we recite the Psalms, we're not equating them with colonialism or with exclusivity. Um, and the second way is to focus on and emphasize those passages of scripture that do encourage inclusivity and do encourage uh, peacemaking rather than those that, um, that uh, justify uh, conflict or war. Yes, and uh, certainly theology matters. We should, um, we should ex explain more what we mean by these terms uh use you know biblical israel if needed in uh, and differentiate it from the secular state of israel and so on but it's all about raising awareness theology education in in churches it's it's really it's really uh, important mm -hmm. one last uh, summary kind of question if you both could could uh, sum up uh, this um this ultimately the question of how do we uh, respond to christian zionists zionists in a way that they might hear us uh, or how do we respond to those who equate anti-zionism with anti-semitism semiticism that's two questions <laughs> <laughs> um on the first one um i use i use two questions with my zionist friends the first one is uh, was the coming of Jesus a fulfillment or the postponement of the promises God made to Abraham? And the whole emphasis of scripture is that Jesus is the fulfillment. Uh, that any notion that somehow the church is plan B or that the coming of Jesus was unnecessary or irrelevant is heresy. And the second question is, uh, does God have one people or two? Does God have one people or two? It's as simple as that. And again, the whole emphasis in the scriptures is the one people of God. So those are two questions I throw at my Zionist friends. And when they use the, uh, you know, when they equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, I think it's very important we hit that hard and say we repudiate racism. Uh, anti-Semitism is evil. Uh, denigrating people on the basis of their ethnicity, their color, their religion, is anti-Christian, and we repudiate that unequivocally. Uh, but to, uh, to, uh, to challenge a political system or politicians or even church leaders that are justifying colonialism, apartheid, racism, uh, theft, uh, murder, that needs to be called out without fear that you're going to be called a racist because you challenge racism. Thank you. That's helpful. Yes, and and similarly, I would uh, uh, I would bring to the surface the fact that many Jews are not Zionist. Hmm. Uh, so equating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism uh, doesn't work when you have many many Jews today, an increasing number of Jewish activists who are also against Zionism. But at the same time, let's think deeper in that equation. Zionism seeks to build a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine. Uh, and Zionism, in many sense, is telling a Jew in the United States, your home is actually uh, back in, in, in your state. You, you, should, you can't stay with us. Uh, and, and I find that idea, that concept is, 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 is very strange. Uh, to challenge even the Jews who think or who are fighting to keep a Jewish presence in New York or in Berlin and to keep the Jewish, uh, you know, hundreds of years, if not more, of Jewish heritage in these states and to challenge that and say, no, you have to accept Zionism and go back to, your, uh, to, to Israel, I think. And then 
saying that if you go against that, this anti-Semitism is 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 unacceptable. It's uh, it's, it's so strange uh, to me. But uh, I want to end again. Uh, there are ways to challenge, and we've offered ways. But the most important thing, uh, our response to their exclusive nationalistic ideology is God honoring inclusive uh, vision. We should continue to hit that. Uh, in other words, we're not against anybody, uh, but we're for people, we're for a shared vision, and we're against unjust systems. And certainly the occupation is an unjust system. Our alternative to the occupation is not the destruction of Israel, but it's rather an inclusive uh, state that all people are dealt with uh, equally. Uh, when we fight with the truth and with love, we shall overcome ultimately. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you both very much. We certainly know, if we didn't know before, why you are global Christian leaders on this topic. You've, you've given us so much. So thank you for that. I do, before you uh, folks sign off, I want to remind you that you have the opportunity uh, to hear from the friends of the Bill North America, FOSNA, and Jonathan will lead us in about 15 minutes of a presentation with that. But again, thank you for joining. This webinar will be available uh, by recording uh, in the next few days. And may God bless us all. We're going to hear from uh, Jonathan Brenneman now, I believe. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, John. Uh, and I, I will only take about five minutes of your time because uh, things are running late and I don't want to keep people here longer. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Reverend Munther and Reverend Seen. Um, you all laid out so clearly the problems of Christian Zionism and Munther made a very clear call that this is something we have to address. We can't just be uh, opposing it in ideas, but we have to oppose it in action. And that's where FASNA uh, seeks to support you all uh, to take the next step to take actions that truly challenge Christian Zionism. Uh, we have launched a counter Kufi action annually where we challenge Christians United for Israel at their national summit. And we also want to empower local leaders to challenge Kufi in their own um, context, as well as just challenging Christian Zionist theologies. So we've actually created a toolkit that I'm putting in the chat now, um, which has way, which has both uh, helping people to explain Christian Zionism so that maybe you can run one of these webinars someday uh, and be your own authority to speak to others. Because uh, even with the internet, uh, Stephen and Munther can't get to everyone. So this is a way to democratize that work uh, to allow you to, to have the understanding and knowledge um, to challenge Christian Zionism, as well as uh, the main part of this toolkit. Uh, something that we found that people are really looking for and needing is ways to actually confront Christian Zionism. Not just to do education, which is very important, but also to how do you talk to a Christian Zionist? We have, we have notes on that. And particularly, how do you take collective action as a congregation, as a community, as an organization to challenge Christian Zionism. So th that's one resource uh, that we offer. And if you want more information about our campaign um, to challenge Christian Zionism, if you have ideas like challenging US tax codes and want to see that come to fruition, FOSN is here to help. Uh, so if you fill out this form, um, you'll be in a network of people who are finding ways to mobilize their local communities to challenge Christian Zionism, to actively take the steps that Munther on behalf of Palestinians are calling us to take and to move our theology to the streets, to put it into action. This is the way that FASNA is uh, taking on the example of Sabil in Jerusalem uh, and enacting our theology on behalf of Palestinian liberation here in the States. So thank you all for coming to the webinar. Thanks for sticking around a little extra to hear about ways that you can be involved. God bless, and we hope to see you uh, challenging Christian Zionism soon. Thank you for that work, and I remind you also about our September 9th <coughs> webinar, Addressing the Accusation, the Church, and Anti-Semitism.
Welcome to this.